Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? This is a program where we make no apologies, we make no excuses. In fact, we're so delighted we can't can't believe it is possible that we can spend the whole hour and a half around the Word of God and into the Word of God discussing what does God have to say to us in His Word because you see every word in this Bible is God's Word. It is from the mouth of God. Therefore, it is super important, super true and trustworthy. And the Bible was written by God to you and to me. We are human beings who were created in the, hum in the image of God. We were created to serve God and love Him. We are created to be altogether accountable to God for the way we live. And uh, therefore, God has a lot of things to say to us about how we are to live and what the consequences are if we don't live according to the way God has so declared. And we better know about it. We better know about it because, uh, uh, you know, someday we're going to have to answer to God uh, for the way we lived out our life. A lot of people have the naive notion, when I die, it's all over. It's all over. It's as if I've been annihilated. Uh, that's the end. No, it is not the end. The mankind was created in the image of God, which included the fact that we are to exist forever. And if we don't straighten out our relationship with God, then uh, because of our sin, that ugly word sin, which is a trans, which uh, sin is defined by the Bible as a transgression of the law of God, a breaking of the law of God. If we don't straighten out that relationship or have it straightened out before we die or before Christ comes again, it means that we're guaranteed to have to be found guilty and be cast into hell forevermore to bear the wrath of God for our sins. An enormously terrible punishment because sin is enormously terrible. But the Bible also talks about that Christ comes with the gift of salvation. To whom? To whom? That's what we talk about on this program as well as a whole lot of other things that this that are found in the Bible. And so we are so delighted that we can spend a, an hour and a half each evening talking together about what is in uh, the Bible. We have listeners in many parts of the world, and here's a listener in, uh, in Nigeria, uh, and a very, asking a very interesting question. He, he's saying... Uh, uh, is it right to try to see Jesus on the throne when I pray? I've tried it several times successfully. One day I kind of saw him in my room with my eyes shut when I was praying at about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. He just stood there looking at me, and later the picture faded away. If it is not right for me to see him, what should I focus on while praying? Ah, oh, yeah. Yes, how do you know you're, you're seeing Jesus while you're praying? What does he look like? You certainly can't trust these pictures that you see of Jesus or these statues because uh, they are just out of the imagination of mankind. Nobody, there is nobody that can say what Jesus looked like when he was on earth. That's not known. That's not possible. But more than that, the Bible says God is spirit. And they that worship him, worship him in spirit and truth. You know, prayer is a very integral, important part of worship. Worship has to do with bowing down before God, acknowledging him that he is our Lord, that he is our Savior, he is our King, he is everything to us. And this is what we do when we pray. We are begging the Lord. We're beseeching the Lord on this or that. We're thanking Him and so on. 
And worship has to be in spirit and truth. Why? Why? Because God is spirit. He is everywhere present. Can you visualize a God who is everywhere at the same time? Can you visualize a God who spoke and brought this universe into existence? No, we can't do that. That's impossible. We don't have to visualize anything when we pray. We simply pray uh, with our focus on the fact we're talking to God. Oh, God, we, we, there's so little we know about you, but we know you are the infinite creator. You, we know that you are the God of love. We know that you are a God whom uh, we have to answer to. We know many things about you, O oh Lord. But who you are, how we are to see you, we have no idea, and it's not necessary. Very interesting, you know, when you think about this. Uh, the heathen, uh, they want a God that they can, uh, can see when they pray, when they bring their uh, petitions. So the Buddhist makes a, makes a, uh, uh, to, cuts a log and, and carves it out and coats it with various colors and sets it up as a, as a, uh, uh, Buddha of some kind. Or the Hindu may look at an animal and say, that is my god. Or, uh, a, a, some other heathen person may uh, make a little, uh, 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 carve out a piece of wood and, in some grotesque way and say, and put that on a shrine and say, that is my God. Uh, there are those who want to pray to somebody they see, so they pray to saints, or they pray to Mary, or they uh, pray to um, what they think Jesus looked like. And all of that is, is a total rebellion against God. It is trying to bring God down to our level, trying to make him... Uh, someone that we can look at in the eye and take the measure of no way, no way. We come very humbly to God knowing he's the infinite personality uh, who created the world, whom, of course, we cannot envision in any way whatsoever. True, God, Christ took on a human nature. God took on a human nature, but it's very significant that while he was on earth there were no photographs taken and there's no paintings that were made of him of any kind there's nothing that comes out of the historical record that gives us any idea what the Lord Jesus looked like because that is not where our focus ought to be our focus has to be that the Lord Jesus never ceased to be the eternal God the infinite creator of the world so don't ever, ever, ever try to visualize God when you are praying. You just remember that uh, God is uh, revealed to us in his word as, as a majestic, wonderful, eternal, uh, uh, infinite being. And, uh, and we're just so glad that we can even uh, call upon him. What a privilege that we can enter into his throne room at any time praying our Father who art in heaven. How can that be? Well, thank you, Nigeria, for that call, for that question. And now we're going to go to our first call on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Hello. It will only take me... It would only take me five minutes to say what I'm going to say. I know because I read out loud what I wrote on paper. I did it five times to be sure. I say to you, the radio station and the 9 p.m. program, there will be many days, weeks, and months other people can call. But for me, I will do it only this one time and never again. I will not hear or know what people say about what I said. I thought about what I would say. I did this for seven days. Well, excuse me. Now, what is your question? You were, Honey, just, I don't just, have Just a get right into your question, please. Well, remember, it's only going to take me five minutes, so I'll be Well, through. excuse me. I, 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 why do you think you should have five minutes? Now, we are interested in opening the Bible to the Word of God. And, and okay. So you please, me... please ask your question what I'm going to talk about. The two things that are going to happen before the planet Earth is destroyed by fire. 
What 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 do you think is going to happen before? I know because it's in the Bible. Well, what do you think is going to happen? What's going to happen is in the Bible. The Israelites are going to rebuild their temple on the same grounds that it was on. Well, now, excuse me. Now, you are saying something that is widely taught by a great many preachers and denominations, but it has no biblical validity whatsoever. There is, uh, if you look at certain verses of the Bible and just look at them uh, as uh, as if uh, it's just talking about a historical reality, you might get that idea from a couple of verses. But when you recognize that Christ spoke in parables and that the only temple that he spoke about was the body of believers uh, and or himself, remember he said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll rebuild it? The Jews fell into the same snare. They thought he was talking about a physical temple. And they said, oh, no, 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 that temple took 46 years to build. How can you destroy it and three, build it, rebuild it in three days? But Jesus explained, he's talking about himself. He is the temple. By the same token, in 1 Corinthians 3, God talks about a temple, and that is the whole body of, uh, external body of believers that's in you. And so there, there is no place in the Bible. And if you want to offer a verse, you can do that, and we'll look at that verse together. But uh, I can assure you that that, that is not a, an idea that is taught by the Bible. But if you want to offer a verse, go right ahead. Well, honey, Ben, you won't let me say what I wanted to say. Well, excuse me, I'm try we're trying to find truth, and you, I've asked you for a... Uh, wh what direction you're going and you've already indicated that and I thank you for it and so now let's let's see if we can develop that just from the Bible what is the verse you want to offer oh honey I'm sorry okay okay what I want to say to end this is God bless you all the people that are listening thank and, you thank you for and I will not say any more goodbye Thank you for calling, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Good evening. Yes. Um, I'm calling to ask a question about something someone said to me recently, that um, God did not rest on the seventh day. God did not rest? That's not true. We read in in uh, Exodus chapter 20 that God rested on the seventh day that is he created for uh, the world in six days and he rested on the seventh day because God is setting up a a, a sign by which he's indicating uh, that uh, that we are to rest from trying to do any work to get ourselves saved which was typified uh, uh, and signified by the fact that uh, ancient Israel was not to do any work on the seventh day even as God did no work on the seventh day after six days of creation. What, hello? Yes, Mr. Campton. What I'm saying is that I know he rests on the seventh day, but my cousin is saying that he, he when he died on the cross, that's when he rested. Well, that's I, when he rested. Excuse me, when you would you turn your radio off, and that'll help a little bit. It is true that that Sunday or that Saturday, that seventh day, which was the last seventh day Sabbath of the uh, of the era in which that command was to be observed, his body was in a tomb. And there was no work, no work of redemption going on. His body did not see corruption. There was no work going on. The work had all been finished on uh, the Passover day, which was the day before. And that is true. But then we also recognize that uh, when the women came the next morning, on Sunday morning, that God, that God uh, said there's a new era of Sabbath as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath. The end of the, there was a, the one era of Sabbath had come to an end and there was a new era that was beginning. 
Can I ask one other question? Yes. Um, I had an incident. Um, I'm, I'm always listening to family radio faithfully at 8.30. And one day I was in the kitchen, and, like, I actually heard a voice say to me, I could be wrong, but I believe I heard a voice say to me, um, give it a break. What, why? I mean, you listen to it all the time. Give it a break. And, and I, I, as a child of God, I believe that was the devil. Yeah, so well, I, well, excuse me. You, you, if, if you heard a verbalized, articulated word, a word that, uh, that you could hear the sound of, you can depend upon it. It did not come from God because God does not speak to us except through his word. Uh, and so you don't want to pay any attention to that, even though what was heard, what you heard was probably good advice. But you have to remember that that's the way Satan draws people away from the truth. He comes as an angel of light, the Bible says, and uh, that is he looks comes looking like the Christ and Christ. And if he comes to test to tempt somebody uh, into sin, he's not going to look like a dragon with a forked tail uh, and breathing fire. He's going to look like a lamb. He's going to look like an angel of light and sound like Christ as, uh, so that you, we, you can't tell the difference. But we can spot the difference in a second if we know that it is uh, something that is we're hearing from a source other than directly from the Bible. But Mr. Campton, is that possible? Is that possible to hear? Because I couldn't, I know what I heard, and well, I know it was not of God, but I believe, I knew it was, it was, it was not God. I knew it was something like the devil, a, a demon, trying to tell me not to listen to family radio. And I rebuked it, and, and, I, and I listened to the program. But what I'm asking is, is it possible to hear that type of re, I mean response like not from voice. not from God you will <laughs> not hear God speaking to you in that way uh, you uh, you can hear uh, you a voice like if you hear a voice like that it can come out of your own mind sometimes people hear voices because it's their own self, subconscious mind that is speaking and it sounds very very much like it is another person that is speaking to them sometimes it is it can be supernatural and if it is supernatural then it will be from satan now i don't i don't know how you can distinguish between the two but uh, but the important thing is you don't pay any attention to it whatever it is if you hear a voice uh, you don't pay attention to it at all. You listen only to what the Bible said, tells you. Amen. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Um, I have two questions. For, uh, well, let me say, make this comment uh, first, please. <laughs> I, I Thank and praise God for a teacher such as yourself who goes strictly by the words of the Bible and anything you say, uh, whether people disagree with it or not, uh, they could search it out. Uh, you, you, you point them to the right verses uh, where they can uh, look at and, and justify and not justify what you say. Uh, my, qu my first question is, is uh, I know women. What is what is what are what is exactly the role of women uh, concerning uh, the word of God? I mean, I know uh, you. you there are, is there more than one verse that you can point me to to uh, verify that that uh, women aren't to uh, preach in the pulpit? Oh well, first of all, the, the first important verse is. In Acts 2, where God declares that he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh, women and, and men uh, just as equally as men. And, they, and when he talks about pouring out his spirit, he also included, and they shall prophesy. And prophesy means to declare the word of God. 
So we know very well that a woman, uh, in in a general sense, stands on exactly the same ground with men that they have a right to declare the word of God. That is to be a witness in the world. However, there are two areas, two areas where God put a a limit on that. One area was when the whole congregation came together, and that was uh, very, very important during the church age. In uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, God declared that when the congregation came together, the women were to be silent, and that meant they were not to have any part in, uh, in teaching or in preaching in the, in, when the congregation came together. So, secondly, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, God declares that a woman is not to teach or have authority over men. And uh, therefore, uh, we understand that, that if you have a, an adult Bible class, that is, there are men present, uh, you should never have a woman be the teacher. It should be a man. But it, except for those two very narrow limitations, and they only occupy a very tiny percentage of time, a woman has just as, uh, stands on equal ground with a man to declare the word of God, to be a witness to her children or to her neighbor or whoever. And now, um, those last two points, do they still apply with the coming with the uh, coming of the end of the church age? Well, there is no. Uh, uh, well, yes. Uh, if uh, uh, actually, when the whole congregation comes together, it doesn't apply because there is no congregation that comes together. A congregation does not exist today. There are people who come together as some kind of a fellowship, which has no membership, has no spiritual authority. Uh, uh, that is, people who are named as elders or deacons uh, to, or pastors to have spiritual authority. But there may be some teaching going on there, uh, and ordinarily there will be. And then First Timothy 2 would still apply that a woman is not to be teaching. Okay. Thank uh, you very much, Brother Thank Ken. you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, I have a question. It's uh, in, for, in Second Peter. Yes. First uh, uh, chapter one. Yeah, Second Peter chapter one. Let me turn to that a moment. Second Peter. Second Peter chapter one. In which verse? Two nineteen, I think. I'm sorry? Starting from 18. 18. Uh, and this voice which came from heaven we heard. Now, let's, let's start with verse uh, 16. Uh, the Apostle Peter is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That is, God is speaking through Peter. For we have not followed cunning, cunningly devised uh, fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now verse 18, And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. That's talking about Peter's experience when he was in the Mount of Transfiguration, read about that, I think, in Matthew 17. Uh, we, also, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see, Peter actually heard a voice from God, directly from God, when he was with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. But we have a more sure, sure word, that is a much more complete word, 
we have the whole Bible. The whole Bible. Think of how much we can hear the Word of God because every time we open the Bible and begin to read wherever we read in the Bible, we can know that is from the mouth of God. And that is far, far more extensive than what Peter heard on the Mount of Transfiguration, even though that was a wonderful uh, experience that he went through. Oh, and um, and uh, another question is John 4. I'm sorry? John 4. The Gospel of John? Yes. John chapter 4, yes. And verse 21. And verse 21. I think to 25, I think. Yes. Now, Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And, uh, and uh, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when we shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know that we worship for whom we worship. Uh, for salvation is of the Jews. What Jesus was saying is that salvation that came through Christ, and Christ was a, the seed of Abraham, and so he was a Jew, and so salvation came of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And uh, the, this God is describing the fact that, that we don't go to a place called Jerusalem to, mar to worship. We don't even have to go to a congregation to worship. We worship wherever we are as we recognize that who God is, as we bow down and uh, that is spiritually bow down. We, we are uh, looking to him as our king, as the giver of every good and perfect gift, as our savior, and so on. And thank you for calling and sharing. And we're going to pause for a message, and then we'll go to our next caller. We're continuing with the Open Forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, good evening. I have a question. Um, I'm a little confused. You say in your book, um, The End of the Church Age, you're talking about Michael uh, being Christ and binding Satan and everything. And... Um, I thought Michael was the archangel uh, from, like, verse Jude, uh, Jude 1, 9. It talks about Michael the archangel. And then in Daniel, it, uh, Daniel 10, 13, it says one of the chief princes, Michael, one of the chief princes. So somehow some of these verses are a little confusing to me, and I just wanted to understand how... Uh, Christ is represented, you know, in Michael, because well, I thought he was the archangel. Well, first of all, the translators translated the word chief messenger as archangel. The word arch means chief. The, uh, the word uh, uh, that they translated as angel is the Greek word angelus, which also can be translated messenger. And Christ is the chief messenger. We read about him in Malachi chapter 4. He is the messenger of the kingdom. Now, Christ was not an angel at all. Uh, that is just a bad trans translation in the book of Jude where it talks about Michael the archangel. Now, in uh, Daniel 10, where it speaks about Michael, one of the chief princes. Uh, actually, there are three chief princes. There's the Father, the Son, and there the Holy and the Holy Spirit. They are God who rules over us. Now, we don't understand this, that how there can be three and yet there's one God. That's, that's a divine min, uh, uh, mystery. But Christ is distinctly the number one of the, of the or one of the chief princes 
uh, and first and secondly you must remember that no angel is a prince or a king they were not created for that purpose in mind we read in Hebrews chapter 1 they were created as ministering spirits on behalf of those who are to become saved Satan who is a fallen angel went into rebellion against God he wanted to be a king he wanted to be a prince and but he's in complete rebellion against God more than that if you go to Daniel chapter 12 we read there about Michael the prince of his people and and again uh, only Christ is the prince of his people incidentally the word Michael mean who is God and so you you uh, the fact is that that uh, Michael is not an angel at all but unfortunately the translators uh, uh, happened to have translated a couple verse words poorly and they ended up with making Michael appearing uh, appearing to make Michael an angel Okay, I'm sorry. Michael means who is God? Who is God, yes. Okay. May I ask one last quick question? Yes. How do you get the thousand years to represent the church age? Well, the th well only because in Revelation 20, it speaks of Satan being bound for a thousand years and then loosed briefly at the end of the thousand years. And when we search the rest of the Bible uh, to discover when he was bound, everything in the Bible focuses on the time of the cross. Uh, that, that is when there was a change, a distinct change in the fortunes of, uh, of Satan at the time of the cross. And all through the uh, New Testament era, we don't see any other change, but we do know that at the end of the church age, which coincides with the beginning of the final great tribulation in which we presently are, that Satan was loosed. I saw a star fall from heaven. We read in, uh, I think in Revelation 9, verse 1, I, and, and he was loosed from the pit and uh, so that he might again deceive the nations. So that thousand years has to be understood as the completeness of God's plan. God, you know, frequently uses the number 1,000 or 100 or 10 to, con to, in to include the completeness, uh, the idea of completeness. For example, if we go to Psalm 105, 105, this is a very interesting uh, uh, verse. In Psalm 105, verse 8, we read in our King James Bible, He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. That's, what, that's the way it was translated. And the, the word generation was translated generations, plural. However, when we look at the Hebrew language here, very, very distinctly, the word generation is a singular word. Therefore, it should have been translated as a singular word. But if you translate it as a singular word, the verse doesn't make sense. Look what it says. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generation. Well, what's a thousand generations singular? Oh, I see. The word thousand is a synonym for complete. Complete. In other words, if we substitute a synonym complete for the word thousand here, then the sentence makes, makes sense. Uh, the, he hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a complete generation. But if we try to leave it as uh, and understand it, uh, uh, that we have, can only think of it as a number, 1,000 means that there's a whole lot of generations, but that, that verse won't permit it because the word generation is singular. So we have positive proof, positive proof, 
that the word generation or the word uh, thousand yes, uh, can signify that which is complete. So he was bound for a complete period of time. How long? We can't tell until we uh, d discover when he was bound and when he was loosed. And then we see that it's the period between A.D. 33 and 1988 when he was loosed. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Hello. Yes? Yeah, yes, go ahead with your call. I'd like to speak to Dr. Campbell. Brother Camping, yes, you're on Brother the air. Brother Campbell, the Jehovah Witnesses are bothering me. <clears throat> they come to my home, and they want to tell me that the born-again system, according to, to Nicodemus and Jesus, is foolishness. Can well, you shed some light on that, please? Yes, well, first of all, uh, uh, God tells us how to handle that situation. Every many of us are are bothered by this. There are two people. We hear the doorbell ring, and there are two people standing there, and they have the Watchtower magazine, and we know very quickly that they are Jehovah Witnesses, or maybe they're Mormons. Anyway, they're somebody with some other kind of a gospel. Now, uh, God explains. In, in the second epistle of John, in the second epistle of John, he says if, in verse 10, If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, that is the tr truth of the Bible, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speak. So what we do is they come to the door, and I have experienced this as, as many have, and I say, I'm sorry, I cannot speak with you. I would be violating the word of God uh, because you are coming with a different teaching than that of the Bible. And then they begin to want to argue, I'm sorry, I cannot speak to you. And so I just shut the door. And, and that's the end of the matter. And it sounds rude. And I can tell you these two people will walk away rejoicing because they'll feel like they have been persecuted for righteousness' sake or something of that nature. But that's beside the point. The fact is, I want to be obedient. I'm not going to think I can uh, violate God's rule by, by entering into conversation with them. Brother Campion, the, the, the method of the born-again system... What should I tell them in connection with that if they insist? Well, in now, if you have a, a loved one who is in of another kind of a gospel, and she begins to speak to you uh, like a missionary does, and, and everyone who is a devout follower of any religion uh, is convinced in their own soul that they have the truth, and certainly they want their their loved ones and their friends to have the same truth, so they're they're they are trying to talk to you very honestly. They really want the very best for you. But you're just going to have to say very gently, I'm sorry, sis. I'm sorry, my dear one, I love you, but I, I, I don't agree with what you are teaching. And, and uh, I, if you want to hear what, uh, what I believe the Bible says, I'll talk, but, you, but I cannot listen to what your church teaches because... It is not a true church at all, and, no. and and it's it's you know that if if you sense that she really is looking for truth, fine. Then you then you try to teach, but if uh, if you sense that she is simply trying to be a missionary for her false religion, don't engage in such conversation. And thank, thank you, you. Brother Kim. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, I have a question. Psalms, um, chapter one, verse one. Matthew one. I mean, Psalms. Uh, I'm sorry. Psalms, chapter one, verse one. Oh, Psalms, chapter one, verse one. Let's turn to that a moment. Psalm one. 
verse 1. There we read, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Yes, now what is your question? What does God really, I mean, exactly what does he mean by ungodly? And what does he really exactly mean by standing in the way of sinners? And what does he exactly mean by seat of the scornful? Well, no, I, those are excellent questions. First of all, who are the ungodly? Anybody at all who is not saved. And, and you know, the world is composed basically of unsaved people and it has lots of counsel to give us of various kinds and sometimes that counsel just has to do with the right kind of food to eat or or not to uh, uh, jaywalk uh, across the street because you're going to get run over or something of that nature that's one thing but when it has to do with religious matters a relationship with God then you do not want to listen to that kind of counsel. The only counsel, spiritual counsel, has to come from the Bible. And you, uh, but the world, of course, has its own ideas of uh, what is spiritual and, and who God is and how we are to relate to Him or not to relate to Him. We don't want to listen to that at all. We only want to listen to the Bible. Now, or standeth in the way of sinners. Now, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way, uh, when God talks about the way, he's talking about the way in which we can have eternal life. And, uh, and uh, the, those who are not saved, who are still sinners in the eyes of God, uh, they have their ideas about how to get right with God, and we don't want to be a part of that at all. We want to move away from that. We're not going to stand there and listen to that. Uh, we, we want only the way of Christ. Likewise, sitting in the seat of the scornful. The scornful, again, is another synonym for the unsaved. They're scorning the true gospel, they don't want the true gospel, and and uh, yeah, uh, and to sit with them, uh, and and, uh, and be a part of their conversation when they are when they are scorning the Bible. No, we want no part part of that. Child of God, um, you know, with the being a tribulation time and. And we are to continue our relationship with our family members and, and acquaintances and people at work. Uh, but how, what is the exact definition of having a relationship? Because I find myself a lot of times they want to talk about um, somebody's a problem or something like that. Nobody really seems to want to talk about the truth of the Bible. And I'm having a hard time really coming to as to how do I have relationship with people, with well, you're, family you're, members. You are absolutely right. As long as you talk about your children and you talk about uh, a restaurant that you had dinner at or you talk about uh, uh, the latest news from the newspaper or the TV uh, news program, fine. You can have a very uh, animated conversation. But the moment you start talking about the Bible, suddenly it closes off. Suddenly you find that you're all alone because the, bio, the people by nature don't want to hear the truth of the Bible. Uh, the, it, uh, suddenly there's a big silence. Now, I find in my life I have loved ones I would desperately like to speak with at length about these very spiritual things and, and I find it's very difficult, but I pray for opening. I pray for an opportunity, and once in a while there is an opportunity. Many times there is no opportunity, but uh, but uh, we wait upon the Lord for that. We're very patient because it is God who is really in charge of all these affairs, and we uh, and we are not to bludgeon our way. We're not to just say, look. I'm going to tell you about this whether you like it or not, and you, you better listen to me. <laughs> that's, that's just not the way we, we uh, bring the gospel. Do 
I carry on a relationship? That's what I'm, I'm having a hard time. Well, the main thing is, is we have to walk very humbly, very humbly. Remember, it's only the grace of God, only the mercy of God, if we've come to truth. We're no better or more worthy of truth than those of our friends or loved ones who still remain uh, oblivious to the truth or uh, don't want to listen to it. Uh, we're no better than they at all. It's only the mercy of God, and and we should stand in in awe at the fact of why did God open my eyes? And then uh, we should secondly have great pity and great love for our unsaved loved ones, because if they are still in that condition when Christ returns. They're going to be standing at the judgment throne. What a terrible, terrible future they have. And so we should be uh, in sorrow for that and, and be having great pity. Under no circumstance should we feel angered against them or should we be exasperated with them or whatever. Because remember, the only reason that you or I have come to truth about anything is because God opened our spiritual eyes, not because we were more deserving or, or more intellectual or wiser or, or, or anything else. It was totally the mercy of God. And so we, we, in turn, are going to be very patient, very patient with those that we love, and, and we're going to go out of our way to even show our love even more because we have our such a concern for them then how do i talk what do i talk to them about and how do i conduct myself meanwhile i'm waiting upon the lord and praying for oh, them well you certainly don't uh, you don't want to lose your relationship you when you visit with them you certainly can talk about uh, uh, the, the current events and you can talk about uh, uh, your children and you can talk about uh, a lot of other things that are just ordinary things that we talk about together uh, and that's there's nothing wrong with that at all uh, but again you're always praying for an opening if if something is said they may ask you a question you know I noticed that you uh, do this or do that or, or uh, feel this way or that way about something that's an opening where maybe God is allowing you to share something with them spiritual so much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping, I'm here to load my radio. Yes, please. Thank you. Yes, someone's uh, probably found an ark, trying to find the Ark of the Covenant, but I'm going to give you a verse in the Bible that says maybe the uh, Ark of the Covenant might, might have been destroyed. And that's in. Uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 16. Jeremiah 3, verse... Let's look at that a moment. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 16. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more. The ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it. Neither shall they visit it, neither shall the, that be done any more. Uh, that may uh, be indicating that, uh, although uh, uh, this certainly has a spiritual, a big spiritual dimension, and the Ark of the Covenant is a figure of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. However, as we look at history, uh, and we see the temple destroyed by the Babylonians in 587. Uh, we see it again destroyed later on uh, and finally built the third time uh, during uh, the days of Herod, just before Christ was born. And then we see it destroyed once more in A.D. 70, completely destroyed. The likelihood of the ark being still in existence is zero, absolutely zero, number one uh, thing I, that we can uh, look at. Number two 
it's absolutely unimportant, if, even if it did exist somewhere, because it no longer has any meaning or sense. And uh, number three, there are plenty of people out there who are trying to be spectacular. They're trying to prove something, and uh, there are those who have claimed that they have, uh, have an idea where the Ark of the Covenant are, is, or they have seen it or something. I don't buy it for a moment. I, I immediately distrust them altogether. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hi, Brother Camping. Um, I have three questions, if I can ask them. I'm a little nervous, so please bear with me. But I, I notice uh, you refer to, in Revelation 8, 1, the uh, half an hour of silence, the seventh seal. Um, doesn't that come after the sixth seal, which is in chapter 6, where Jesus returns the wrath of, of the Lamb? Oh, uh, in the book of Revelation, we have to be careful that we look at everything uh, not chronological, but we look at everything just as it stands, just as it stands. Now, in, uh, in already in Revelation 6, we already see the sixth seal, which you're talking about, uh, and the stars of heaven f fell unto the earth, even as the fig tree cast their untimely figs, and the heaven departed as a scroll, and so on, and that's the end of the world. That's That's absolutely the time when Christ is, is, will return on the last day. And so if we were going to look at this, uh, the book of Revelation in any sense chronologically, then we would have to say, uh, unless, unless the context clearly shows chronology, and sometimes it does, but here it's definitely showing that the chronology doesn't enter into it. It is, it is in, in uh, when the sixth seal is opening, it is, it is discussing one aspect of the end of the world and then when it comes down to the seventh seal and there was silence in heaven uh, that is uh, that is another piece of information in connection with the details of the end of the world but it is not there's no possibility that we could look at that in a chronological uh, way so essentially the seventh seal you, you would be saying precedes the sixth seal. Well, it's not e no. When you use the word precede, you are using a chronological word that first one thing happens then another. Okay. Uh, but you, we we can't look at the seven seals. We have to look at it as seven pieces of information. Uh, the each uh, the opening of each seal gives us another piece of information. Uh, my, my, uh, my second question is, when you refer to the multitude, the multitude that no man can number, when I read that in Revelation 7, it's, it seems the, the, this multitude are standing before Christ in, in their white garments as if they're no longer alive on earth, as if they've been killed, and they're in heaven. Am I misunderstanding that? Yes, you're misunderstanding that. Uh, they are, they are, are those who have come out of great tribulation. Now, uh, the Great Tribulation is only used, that phrase is only used four times in the New Testament, and it's a very distinct uh, phrase that is speaking about the final tribulation that began in, from everything we can read in the Bible in 1988 and will continue to the last year, if we're correct about that, to a 2011, in other words, a 23-year period. And, uh, and uh, the... Uh, the uh, uh, twenty, the uh, great multitude which no man can number, come after the uh, the sealing of the 144,000, which have everything to do with the end of the church age, and uh, and uh, these come out of a great tribulation. That is, they are those who are saved during that 23-year period says that they're serving uh, the Lord day and night, that that means serving them on earth because they're saved? Well, yes. The moment we become saved, we are serving the Lord. And, and we don't, it's not an off-again, on-again proposition. We serve the Lord 
always constantly because we have received a brand new resurrected soul in which we never want to sin again. We are his servants uh, perpetually. I would assume I would assume that the figure of speech to be, be before the throne would be a figure of speech of salvation then? Well, it definitely is a figure of, of salvation. Be robed with white robes is a figure of salvation, that we're now robed with the righteousness of Christ. Okay. But now i got to say, are we going to pause right now? Because we're going to have an, a message, and then we'll go on to our next caller. Thank you. Thank you. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't know if it's really a question. I just got a comment, I guess. You say that, uh, actually two things. You say that the, um, the, the tribulation period is 23 years, and I want to say something else about that, but let me get the other part out, too. Also, that uh, when you become a true believer, you have an intense desire to do the things of God. But if... You don't, and you you don't have that before. So that's how you say you know that you're saved. How do you explain that? You know, all these people going and and reading their Bible, and you tell them to do this stuff, and if they're not saved, then they're not going to understand the Bible. They're not going to understand what they're doing. So it's it's basically making no sense. And where in the Bible does it say that the tribulation is 23 years old or 23 years long? Well, first of all, in insofar as uh, uh, telling people that uh, that they'll have an intense desire to do the will of God, uh, there are a lot of people who read the Bible because uh, they know that that is a very good thing to do, and they will have some understanding of the Bible. Salvation is not a function of what we understand; it's a function of. Uh, of uh, obedience that whatever we do understand we have a real desire to be obedient to that uh, there are a great many who read the bible and and follow the doctrines of their denomination which uh, and every denomination has p picked and chosen certain verses from the bible i don't think there are any exceptions they have picked and chosen certain v verses of the bible that and wove them together into the doctrines that they believe they are to hold and and people can be very zealous in their attempt to be obedient to that but the fact is we have to have an attitude and not only an attitude but a, a real uh, understanding that that's not good enough by any stretch of the imagination we have to be ready to look at anything and everything in the Bible and we're bound to find certain things that run counter to what our church teaches and then what do we do do we go along with what our church teaches or do we go along with the Bible and that's where the test really becomes uh, 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 very intense and and uh, the, the, but it, it is true that that the more we uh, if we have become saved, we find a greater and greater desire. I want to do the will of God, or to say it the other way, I, I am very miserable when I think maybe I'm not doing the will of God the way I should. I, I oh Lord, have mercy and strengthen me and work in me so that I will do the word of will of God more faithfully. Now, insofar as the length of the great tribulation the bible doesn't tell us anywhere that it's 23 years long the bible doesn't say that but there's a great amount of circumstantial evidence for example let me give you just one illustration the we do know very absolutely that the time period from creation until God brought judgment upon the world the first time and destroyed the whole world with the exception of Noah and his family who were in the ark that he built the, this huge craft to save them from that flood that time period was exactly 6,023 years very significantly that, that 23 years stands out 
we also know that from the time of the flood until Christ went to the cross to endure the wrath of God, uh, we know that that was a period of exactly 5,023 years inclusively, including uh, the year of the flood as well as the year that Christ uh, uh, endured the wrath of God. Uh, so again, the number 23 stands out in a very peculiar and special way related to that 5,000 year period. Now, they, the, the, those two facts we know absolutely. They're not, they're, there's no circumstantial thing about that. That just is simply uh, drawn from the, the uh, careful analysis of the direct statements of the Bible. Uh, however, it's interesting that from the creation until 2011, which is a uh, which is the uh, year that is mo um, most likely to be the year of Christ's return, turns out to be exactly 13,000 plus 23 years. Isn't that interesting? Now that could be coincidental. Of course it could be. But given the fact that God does not do things coincidentally or accidentally, God, uh, as I have worked through the patterns, the number patterns of the Bible when this happened and that happened, uh, I, all, I see constantly uh, that God has a very precise pattern which he is following. He, uh, it is, there's no evidence of, of things falling into place by uh, uh, accident or, or promiscuously or haphazardly. It, everything falls into place in accordance with some kind of a pattern and that fits right up through the year 2011. It's also interesting, for example, that, that the year 1994 is a jubilee year, and that fits right into place with a lot of other number patterns that, that we work through as we go through the Bible. Incidentally, uh, I've written a book called Time Has an End, which you can buy at your local bookstore, and it's... Uh, uh, should be available there, and uh, and uh, uh, that will give you a lot of information about this. Okay, Mr. Camping, you say that. Uh, uh, I want to kind of go on this 23 years in in the Bible. I don't know exactly the verse, but it's it's talking about you know there'll be three and a half good years and three and a half bad years. Now, um, you also said that it says in the New Testament, uh, tribulation four times, talks about the great tribulation. But it talks about, you know, tribulation all throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. I think they're getting confused with the great tribulation and tribulation. We're all going to have tribulation in our lives, you know. Uh, well, I, the I, great tribulation is, you know, a different story. Well, but you see... Uh, you are correct. We read in John 16, verse 33, in the world you will have tribulation. That's a common word that's used throughout the world. We, as believers, do have tribulation. But that's a different uh, uh, emphasis than what we find in Matthew 24. And then there will be great tribulation, such as this world has never known nor ever shall know. And then God insists in verse 29 of Matthew 24, and immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shine. In other words, God is identifying a particular tribulation, calling it the great tribulation, uh, and, and identifying it with a period of time that comes just before Christ returns. And uh, that is, uh, uh, that is uh, what we have to keep in mind when we use that word, great tribulation. But thank you. Mr. Camping? Yes. Now, you, you say, you know, you always go to, ver you know, you go, always go to uh, Matthew 24 and stuff, but that's talking of the great tribulation that hasn't happened yet. All the stuff in those verses, you know, uh, I mean, I don't. I, I can go through it, and I know you don't have the time to stay on. But 
we can go through all these verses and this stuff hasn't happened yet. It didn't happen in 88, it hasn't happened in 98, well, it hasn't ex happened yet. Ex excuse me, it depends on if we're understanding what God is saying. For example, in Matthew 24 it says, When the abomination of desolation is standing in the holy place, and you're saying, well, that hasn't happened. Well, what do you what do you think it, that's going to be? And we can't just get look around outside here and and uh, and and see uh, uh, what we think the abomination of desolation is, and and where where is the holy place? We have to look at the Bible, and the Bible tells us uh, that uh, about the abomination of desolation that that has to do with Satan ruling. The only holy place that has existed is where the Bible is. That is the holy book, and it is uh, it is under the caretaking of the local congregations. And and so God is saying that when when the uh, when uh, Satan is ruling in the local congregation, and that matches the language of Second Thessalonians two, where it says in verse three that the man of sin will take his seat in the temple and and it matches other language and so we we have to work from the language of the bible and we can't just say uh, kind of casually or flippantly or uh, like we know everything you know well i don't see this in in matthew in, in the world today no i'm sure you don't but you, that's because you're looking in the wrong place you have to be looking carefully in the Bible. Now because of the extremely serious character of what we're talking about, we're not talking about uh, whether it's going to rain tomorrow or not or whether a certain ball club is going to win the pennant. Uh, that's, that, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the most important issues this world will ever face. We're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about time and eternity. We're talking about uh, uh, something so enormously important. It also means that as we talk about it, we better do our homework and get all the scriptural uh, material we can have and make sure we've looked at everything that might relate and and uh, be very careful about this and that's why books like uh, the end of the church age and after and wheat and tares are being offered free of charge to our listeners and please read those very carefully uh, that and that at least will stimulate your thinking as to what uh, some of the things that might relate to that in the Bible. Mr. Camping, I understand that, but what I'm trying to say is, you know, you, you say the abomination of desolation in the holy place. That's not just since 1988. That's, you know, the Pharisees were doing that stuff back in those days. Well, so why, well, why not back then? Why 88? Because you are not, you are simply asking for an answer that requires intense uh, study of a great many verses in the Bible. It is not something that just comes just in five seconds. It's something that uh, where we have to assume, uh, absorb a lot of information in the Bible. Have you asked for the book uh, at the end of the church age and after? Have, have you asked for that from Family Radio? You can get it free of charge. No, Please. I haven't. Well, read that first, please, and, and Wheat and Tares, which is a companion book. Read that, please. It's the, everything written there is drawn from the Bible, and it'll give you a little bit be, bigger, better idea of how, how much information relates and has to be taken into account as we study these questions. But it's all right from the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Brother Camping. Um, I was talking to a Muslim, a Muslim the other day, and I was trying to pretty much witness to him. And he came at me with a question, and he said that about talking about Jesus saying to, um, in the Bible that there's none holy. There's I'm, why you call me holy. There's none holy except the Father. And I wanted to know: was that because he had the sins of our well, sins on his shoulder at the time, or what? 
No, you see, the um, uh, Muslim uh, religion uh, is a product of somebody studying the Bible and drawing out of the Bible certain truths uh, and and in, in incorporating them into that particular religion. It's no different than uh, than the Roman Catholic or the uh, Mormon or the. Uh, um, many of the other Gospels where certain verses are pulled out and then they become a part of, a, of another Gospel that, uh, that uh, where there, uh, there's added to these things from the Bible a whole lot of other ideas that come out of the mind of men. Incidentally, we have a little booklet that's almost ready to be passed out and uh, will be given. given. It is a testimony of an individual who had been a devout uh, uh, Mohammedan and uh, was out to really uh, 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 make trouble for the Christians in his community and as he was so doing God took hold of him and he became a child of God and it's a very fascinating uh, testimony we put it's in a booklet form that we are just about ready to release it'll be given away free of charge so when you hear about that be sure you send for a copy because it'll also help you if you happen to be witnessing to a a uh, dear person who is a Muslim uh, and uh, and you're you wanted to uh, be able to uh, have a little bit better idea of who you're witnessing to. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Campin. Yes. Uh, when you came on the show earlier, when you started your show, you said um, people need to start getting their stuff ready to be saved. That they have to which? That they need to straighten themselves out and get ready. Well, we have to, yes. How do we get ready? Well, you you have said that only the elect will be yeah. Yeah. saved. That's where our hope is. If I'm not saved, my, I'm so glad that God has elected people to salvation, and it's still the day of salvation because I could be one of God's elect just as quickly as anybody else. That gives me great hope. Now, I don't know whether I'm one of God's elect, but I also know that uh, uh, God, the environment in which God saves is the Bible. The faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so, uh, if I'm not saved, and I am seriously uh, concerned about that, I'm going to be reading the Bible reading the Bible and praying that I might be obedient and at the same time I also have a wonderful privilege of praying and begging and beseeching God that God wants me to do that as a matter of fact oh God have mercy have mercy I am a sinner and uh, and that doesn't mean that guarantees I'm going to get saved but it certainly can let me know that God is aware of my intense desire more than that when I read the Bible, I find that Christ came for sinners, and that fits me uh, if I recognize that I really am, uh, honestly recognize I am a sinner, then I am also a, uh, again, a, a, it, I could readily be one of God's elect. And, and incidentally, the Bible also insists that God is not a respecter of persons. So whether I'm poor or rich or young or old or or uh, have a good intellect or, or a poor intellect or, or no education or a whole lot of education or whatever, it makes no difference. I am, I am just as much a candidate, a possible candidate for salvation as anybody else. But in the meanwhile, I know I have to wait upon God. God has to do it. God has to do it. And so there's an enormous hope for, every, for those who are still unsaved. Read 1 John 1 9. Well, John 1 9. 1 John 1 1st, 9. Yeah, 1 John. Let's read yes. that. Let's read that. This is in your track. Um, does God love you? Yeah. Have you read your track lately? 
Well, I haven't read it for a while. I well, it's, it's but wonderful. Let, let, let's, let's, it, all, it has success. Let, let, let me read First John chapter 1, verse 9. There we read, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, the key word here is confess. Confess is not just admit I'm a sinner, but to be of the same mind with God and want to do his will. And I will only be of the same mind of God and want to do his will if God has saved me. If God has saved me. And uh, so this is a true statement if we confess uh, our sins. But uh, the fact is we will not confess our sins. That is, we will not be of the same mind with God until God has actually done the work of salvation in our lives. Preaching. The first thing he started saying was repent. I'm sorry? As soon as Jesus started preaching, he started going out preaching. Yes. yes. He, one of his first words was repent. Well, yes, and but who who will repent? Well, people do that hear hear the word. That's the whole thing about no, preaching the gospel. Nobody it's, will repent. The Bible faith. tells us that we God commands us to repent. God commands us to repent. No question at all. But okay. uh, but we are spiritually dead. We are spiritually a corpse, a stinking corpse. We, uh, there is none that seeketh after God. That is no one. We all want to get saved, but we want to get saved on our own terms. And so when the Bible says, you must repent, that brings us right back to square one. Oh God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me because I know I'll never repent in a way that's pleasing until you give me a brand new resurrected soul because then I'll be completely turned around. That's what repentance is. It's because not, uh, before I'm saved in my soul, like in my body, I want to do my will. But when I become saved, I will only want to do God's will in my soul. And that is true repentance. But that can only come when God has saved me. And so we start right where we are. Oh, God, have mercy, have mercy. And... Uh, and I know you have to do the whole work, and uh, and in the meanwhile, I'm going to read the Bible, and and please uh, help me to be as obedient, uh, help me to understand some of it, and be obedient to what I stand there, uh, understand there, and then I wait upon God, wait upon God. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening, welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, could you please read Genesis 2.18? Genesis chapter 3, verse... Chapter 2, please. Chapter 2, verse what? 18. Verse 18. Genesis 2, verse 18. There we read, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. Now, what is your question? And could you also read Revelation chapter 12, verse 1? Revelation 12, verse 1. Let's look at that. There we read. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And that woman, is that the same woman that has the child in the wilderness? Yes. Is that child that the woman has the help from Genesis 2.18 that God thinks the man should have? Spiritually, yes, you're correct. Uh, uh, physically, of course, man uh, uh, became married to a woman uh, in order that children might be brought forth. But, but the woman that was given to Adam, Eve, was also a picture of uh, the body of believers that were given to Christ. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. How are you this evening? Very well, thank you. Good. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, 
First of all, how do we know what is a blessing? What is a blessing? What, what, in, what in our life is a blessing? Like if we get a new job or a new car, I mean, how do we know when something is a blessing or if it's just one of our desires that's being fulfilled? Well, that may not be good for us. Well, a blessing is something that is spiritually good for us. And if a new automobile causes us to uh, turn uh, uh, away from God, it is not a blessing. If, uh, on the other hand, we could lose a job and uh, really uh, have to uh, have a hard time making a living for a while, and that could be a great blessing because it may cause us to be far more dependent upon God than ever before and, and uh, be far more concerned about how we walk before God. So a blessing depends on what, the, what it has produced in our life. Oh, okay. Okay. And I have one last question. Uh, I have a family member that is very hard to talk to you, argumentative, and they keep telling me that, you know, I should go to a church and thank the Lord for things he's done for me. And we just have different beliefs. Before I even found Family Radio, I realized that something was happening, and I left my own church and was led to sit down and read my Bible. And I don't know where they're taking me, but this family member is just so, they always want to approach me and yell at me and be argumentative, and I'm not sure how to handle it or even witness to them so they understand that well, I'm doing well, something else now. You've got to remember, when we come to truth, we're going to be misunderstood. Uh, people will misunderstand us who in themselves, they think they have the truth, and so they can yell and scream at us even. But we have to uh, be very patient and very loving and understand the, uh, the, if we've come to truth, it's only the mercy of God that I have come to truth. And I'm going to do it God's way, even though my loved one who thinks that they know better are going to yell and scream at me. I'm still patiently going to do it God's way. And that's the way we have to live. And we have to remember that when we come to truth, we are going to be in opposition with people all around us because God only brings a small percentage of the people to truth, and, and we certainly didn't deserve it either, and yet he did. And so, uh, that, but then we can expect that uh, in the eyes of others, while they don't think it this out consciously, subconsciously they think we have betrayed them like we are better than they or like we have uh, uh, kind of reached come to a higher level of understanding or something and you want to walk very humbly so that they don't get that idea but I have to say good night we've come to the end of our time until our next open forum may the Lord richly bless you good night